My parents moved to Station Cottage around a year ago. It's an 1800s house with a few previous deaths, although they are long in the past. It is named Station Cottage, as it was built for the station master. The actual station was demolished, and its pieces were used to build the other houses nearby. It was an interesting idea, and in fact, the architect who engineered this is my neighbor. To my knowledge, this house was built for this purpose. A station master moved in, and then the train line was completed in 1869. It closed to passengers in 1930, so it's now only a freight line. In June, I graduated from university and came to visit for a few months. Previously, I had been estranged from my parents, so this was the first time I had visited the cottage. It's so peaceful. I've always lived in rural areas, but this was something else. Just being in the house helps me breathe deeper and feel a sense of relaxation I've never experienced elsewhere. And that's saying something considering I have complex PTSD and a myriad of other mental and physical difficulties. My parents agree completely. When I was a teenager, I was a practicing Wiccan witch. I still believe, but I rarely have the time to practice my faith. My aunt is also a Wiccan witch who practices frequently. She's very sensitive to the feel of places, and when she visited, she said that this was a good home with kind energy. This energy is strongest in the front bedroom. Everyone who visits agrees. To me, the energy feels feminine and gentle. When my mother told me about this, and I experienced it for myself, I asked her if she'd had any specific supernatural experiences here. She told me of a time when the keys in the front door swung back and forth for over 20 minutes at a time, with no discernible reason. She said that sometimes they feel their hair pulled playfully, small things like that. Initially, they had no doubt that there were spirits here, but they never really talked about it. While my parents once saw a ghost and are believers, it's always been me who seeks these things out after my own supernatural experiences as a child. These are very personal to me, so unfortunately, I don't feel comfortable sharing them here. At first, I experienced the same things as my parents, pulled hair, the keys swinging, sometimes just a feeling of someone else in the room. I was the only one who noticed a pattern, however. The more prolonged experiences were often after someone had raised their voice or had a fight. My mother is a very combative person. While she's mellowed out a lot since moving here, she does often raise her voice to my father, who then returns her energy. I've always felt that these things are caused by the feminine spirit. As if she's saying, don't fight. You're a family. She feels very motherly. The first time I saw a full-bodied apparition in the house, my parents were asleep. I went to the downstairs toilet, truthfully, in my underwear. I was in the living room passing through the dining room and into the kitchen. The conservatory and the back bedroom are the only parts of the house that aren't original. Some of the kitchen is original, but it's been extended. The kitchen you can walk into is shaped kind of like a flat U with a breakfast bar in the middle. The dining room door is to the bottom left. The back door is to the top left, and the downstairs toilet door is to the top right. The base of the flat U-shape is what's original. The two prongs are the extensions. The back bedroom is then a square above the kitchen, and the conservatory wraps around the outside of part of the dining room and kitchen in a quarter circle. I hope this makes sense. So, I went to the downstairs toilet, did my business, and rounded the corner of the kitchen to the original part of the kitchen, facing the dining room. There was an old man there, standing in the doorway. He had on some sort of suit, a hat, white hair, and a beard. He was carrying a walking stick. Mostly, I just noticed his face. He seemed surprised and embarrassed, just as much as I was surprised to see him there. As soon as I registered this, he was gone. I stood for a moment, taking in what I had seen. I didn't feel scared or anything, and he didn't feel like an intruder here. Rather, I felt as though he was meant to be here, and I would have been just as surprised to see one of my parents standing there. As I passed through the doorway, I apologized for surprising him, turned out all the lights, and closed the doors. 
I now make sure to be completely dressed when downstairs, close doors after I enter a room, and open doors to the dining room slowly so he knows that I'm coming in. Sometimes, when I'm in the living room or kitchen, I feel his presence in the dining room, so I knock first. I think he's easily surprised when we come in, but he doesn't seem to mind sharing the house with us. I remember wondering if the feminine spirit was his wife or daughter. For several days, I didn't tell my parents, not for any particular reason, just because it felt like such a normal, ordinary experience. My previous experiences with the supernatural have been not scary, but ominous. There was a time I could have died if I hadn't heeded the warning of the hat man. Every time I have felt as though I needed to tell someone, anyone, this didn't feel like that. The only reason I'm posting here is, perhaps posterity and curiosity as to what others might think. The next experience I had was in my bedroom. The back bedroom, which as I explained earlier, isn't original. I'm not sure that that really matters though, since clearly the spirits here are very aware of their surroundings. I was trying to sleep on a hot night with the windows open. In my bedroom, there is a solid wood desk and someone kept knocking on it. It was quite persistent, as if someone was trying to get my attention. I'm not sure why I didn't do anything about it. I just kept trying to sleep. I suppose I knew that they didn't mean any harm and didn't feel like an intruder. Whatever they wanted, it didn't seem important enough at the time. In the morning, I kept trying to debunk it in my head. The cottage is detached. My parents were asleep at the time. It's the one experience I'm not sure about. I didn't feel any energy from it. It just happened. Sometimes I wonder if it was a wandering spirit brought in from the railway line. My mother experienced the next full-bodied apparition. It was around 6 p.m., still daylight, and she was standing by the back door in the kitchen, washing something for dinner. We always leave the conservatory doors open due to the heat. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw a man walk through the doors and come up to the back door next to her. She didn't pay attention to his appearance, as she thought that it was my father, until she saw my father walk through the conservatory doors as well. She looked at the man in the doorway and described him identically to the old man I saw. My father saw the back of him briefly before he disappeared. My mother said that he didn't look surprised like she was, but looked kindly. I quote, he looked as if he was coming home for his dinner after a long day's work. I was amazed that we had all experienced the same apparitions now and all had the same sense that they were just ordinary people who belonged here. Last week, I went back to my university to pack up my things and move them into a storage facility. I returned home yesterday, gladly. I was standing by the back door, waiting for my father to bring in a box. I turned to look around in the kitchen, but stopped when I looked at the dining room door. A dark head and a hand were peeking out at me from the dining room. It ducked in when I looked at it, which made me smile to think that a spirit cares so much about me coming home that they appeared to me. It was as if it were saying, What's going on? Oh, it's you. Welcome home. I'm pretty sure it was a male spirit, so it could have been the old man, but I'm not certain, especially as I think there might be a third spirit here that I have yet to put my finger on. A male spirit, maybe a teenager or a young man. I don't have any evidence for this. It's just a feeling I have. Someone more playful than the old man or the woman, perhaps who also does some hair pulling of their own. This experience is why I decided to share the story of Station Cottage so far. I felt so happy to be in a place where I was wanted and welcomed, even by the dead. I feel blessed to be able to share this house with them. This may not be wholly related to the spirits here, but I feel like Station Cottage has given my family a new lease on life. Our old house was a new building with no previous residents, yet it had horrible vibes to it. I always felt scared and paranoid, trapped. Here I just feel free. All of us have been able to make the changes we want to, and we get along better here than anywhere else. I've experienced a lot of bad things and abuse in the past, including at the hands of my parents, but it seems moving here has changed everything in our dynamic, and I personally attribute it to the peaceful nature of the spirits here. 
I would love to know your thoughts on the spirits of Station Cottage and if you also feel grateful for the spirits that haunt your house. Thank you for reading my story. This event didn't happen to me, but to my late husband, John, back when he was 15 years old, and I have no reason to doubt the validity of his account. He and I have both had paranormal encounters throughout our lives. He was quite psychic himself, having gotten that ability from his mother's side of the family. Back in 1961, about several months after the Parma rail station closed permanently, he and his buddy, Eddie, decided to go exploring the abandoned two-story building to see what they could find of interest. Back then, it wasn't called urban exploration. It was called trespassing, plain and simple. They were old enough to know better, but too young to resist. I'm not being critical of them since I've trespassed once or twice in my youth myself. The last time I trespassed was with my cousins and sister in Pennsylvania. We were greeted by a farmer with a shotgun. Lesson learned. I no longer trespassed after that incident. First, a little background on the original railroad station. It was opened in 1909 as part of the B&O Railroad. The site was located in Parma, Ohio. It was a passenger train at first. In 1913, it was enlarged by adding a second story to the building. In 1926, it went from transporting passengers to hauling coal and freight. It operated in that capacity until it completely shut down in 1961. The building was completely demolished in 1962, thus preventing curious teens and whomever from invading the premises for a thrill, let alone possible injuries or fatalities since it was run down and not safe to walk around in. Before that happened, John and his friend, Eddie, decided it would be neat to go explore the place to see what interesting treasures they could find. They waited for a weekend. It was nearing nightfall. They mounted their bikes since it wasn't too far to get there. It took less than half an hour to get there by bike. It was a bit darker when they arrived, but they each had a flashlight with them. They dropped their bikes near the perimeter and ventured on to the vacant building. The office door was locked. However, what appeared to be a large garage door was partially open for them to gain access. From there, they entered what looked like a warehouse that had four doors to the right of it. Those doors led to different office areas, with a long hallway between them. They entered the main dispatch office. Inside, it was very dark, as there were certainly no streetlights outside. They shined their flashlights around to peruse the area. They saw a number of old metal desks lined up along the wall with all sorts of antiquated office machines sitting on them. They noticed a huge old map covering an area of wall on the far end of the room. It smelled extremely musty and dirty. Because it was rather dark with no ambient streetlight, they moved cautiously through the office, inspecting the desks and opening the drawers that were now just empty, except for some old tattered file folders that smelled moldy. They were rather engrossed in trying to see what they could possibly find that might be useful to take back home when they both heard a steady click, 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 click noise fairly nearby. They were puzzled as to the source of that noise since they knew the building was empty. They began shining their lights around, trying to locate the source. Suddenly, Eddie nervously remarked to John that he had found it and to come look at what he was seeing quickly. John hurriedly left the area. He was checking out to join Eddie in front of a large desk located in the middle of the office. On the desk was a very old type of adding machine, the kind with a lot of keys and an arm on the side of it that had to be pulled down to advance to the next row. I think it was called a comptometer, but don't quote me on that. They stood in relative shock and amazement when they noticed that the keys on the device were being punched, making the clicking noise by themselves with no human agent nearby to operate it. They snapped out of it rather abruptly when Eddie winced and told John that they should get the bleep out of there. He began pushing John toward the entry door that they came in and out of the warehouse, then outside, running toward their bikes. John said he didn't know Eddie could run that fast since he was on the somewhat portly side. 
Once they reached the bikes, they paused to catch their breath. Eddie was almost hyperventilating by that point, but was beginning to calm down enough to talk. John noticed how rattled and pale Eddie was. He asked him what happened to alarm him like that. Eddie rather sheepishly told John that he heard a woman's stern voice close to his ear, telling him to stop poking around and leave. John told him that he didn't see anybody in there but the two of them. However, when they both glanced back at the building where the windows to the offices were located, they saw the face and partial silhouette of an older woman. She looked to be dressed like they did in the 1940s, with gun little gray hair in a short curled hairstyle and a clipboard clutched to her chest. It was the look on her face that sent chills down their spines. She did have a very stern demeanor to her facial expression. They didn't stick around to rationalize or discuss it. They just hopped on their bikes and pedaled like the wind back home. They had had enough adventure for one night. The next day, John went to Eddie's house and his friend felt a bit more comfortable talking about the previous night. Eddie told John that he used to be a skeptic in regard to things like ghosts, but he couldn't explain what he heard and what they both observed the other night inside the building as well as the strange woman standing at the window glaring out at them. John told him that the building was very old and had seen a lot of use and activity in its day. He surmised that possibly the phantom woman was a former secretary who used to work there. It was quite possible that being a secretary was very important to her, and after she passed, she came back to the place where she felt useful and happy. John said, I think we disturbed her space and she let us know about it, to the point of chasing us out. Eddie had to nod in agreement. It made sense at that point. They kept the incident between themselves and never went back to the place. When it was demolished the following year, they both wondered if the lonely secretary finally moved on, no longer having her office desk to work at. It was a little piece of Ohio Rail history that they wanted to investigate, but it didn't quite turn out the way they thought it would. John told me he didn't go exploring old buildings after that. No more trespassing for him, either. John and I were part of the population that had to learn the hard way. Hopefully, these accounts serve to enlighten our younger readers that you should be very careful. It was Anzac Day, Sunday, April 25, 2021. The hard lockdown had just been eased, and we were allowed to emerge into the sunlight again. I thought it was time to use the gift voucher I had been given before the pandemic and treat my husband, Rex, and myself to lunch at the old quarantine station. Q Station, as it is now known, is part of Sydney Harbour National Park, located at North Head, near Manly. It was established in 1832 with the aim of stopping diseases from the early immigrants from spreading to the rest of the Australian population. The health threats at the time were many. Among them were the bubonic plague, Spanish influenza, cholera, tuberculosis, scarlet fever, typhus, and smallpox. For over 150 years, shiploads of immigrants were required to remain at the quarantine station for 40 days upon arrival. Many people spent their final days there in pain and misery. Their tragic stories are a reminder of dark times in Australia's past. Over 13,000 people were quarantined within its walls, and at least 572 were thought to have been buried there, though the numbers could have actually been higher. But over time, medical science, immunization, and quarantine procedures improved, and the mortality rate decreased. The quarantine station remained in operation until 1984. Some of the most horrendous experiences came from the building known as the Showers, where more harm than good was done to the immigrants with harsh bleach in the name of disinfection. It is not surprising, given its grim history, that there are documented accounts of hauntings at the Q station, from staff and visitors alike. Many are centered around the Showers. I was a bit nervous about the Q station, so I said a prayer before we went, asking the powers, that be for spirit guardians to watch over us. Immediately after that, I felt more enthusiastic about the outing. In fact, 
Rex and I were positively supercharged with energy. This was unusual for us, as we are both neither exactly youthful nor particularly energetic. It felt as if someone else was eager for us to be on our way, giving us a spiritual lift, so to speak, and making sure we got going. We were pleasantly surprised that everything went so smoothly en route to the key station. Peak hour traffic in the Manly area was normally a frustrating and gnarly experience. That day, we simply cruised along, hassle-free, and with green lights all the way, getting there half an hour earlier than expected. The parking area looked dauntingly full, but just as we drove in, a car pulled out. Perfect timing. We found a spot about a hundred meters from the visitor center, where we were to catch the minibus down to the Boiler House restaurant. As we waited for the transport to arrive, I sat on the bench outside the visitor center and said another prayer for any troubled souls who lingered and were not at rest. I asked if my spirit guardian could help some of the sad and suffering ones, the ones in need. Perhaps she could persuade them to move on and find peace and tell the nasty entities to bugger off. It was not long before the minivan came to bring us to the Boiler House restaurant. The historic russet-colored brick building had the largest chimney stack of the side. I think that they used to do the communal laundry there as well as provide hot water for the showers. Since it was a sunny day, the restaurant had set up alfresco dining at the tables outside. While waiting for our food, I took a photo of the chimney stack of the boiler house. Because I was facing the sun, the chimney and adjacent dining area came out in shadow, but I liked the silhouette effect against the sky. Lunch was excellent, and the service was even better. The one jarring note came from the next table. A young man, wearing a pink polo shirt with a fancy animal emblem, looked us up and down as we were seated. From my position at our table, I could hear his rather derogatory remarks about us to the older couple with him, presumably his parents. After they finished their meal and left, Rex and I laughed about it. The incident amused us rather than causing any affront. I had the sudden impulse to glance over at their table. One of them had left their phone. Rex quickly hailed them to come back and retrieve it. They were most embarrassed. We got the distinct impression that someone was teaching them a lesson. On our return to the reception area, I looked across the path from the boiler house as we traveled up the hill in the minivan. The building on the right looked like a small, nondescript toilet block. My skin began to prickle along my arms and legs. From the narrow, dark opening at the side, I could just make out closely set cubicles made of thin white partitions. They felt unbearably sad and full of despair. I asked Rex where the infamous haunted showers were, wondering if that was it. He had been there some years ago and was sure it lay somewhere farther up the hill. But the woman who had sat at the other table at the boiler house surprised us by speaking up. It just so happened that they had been on the history tour earlier in the day. She confirmed that the building was, you guessed it, the showers. When we came home, I went over the photos I had taken and realized there was something odd. The blue orb is shown in the photo of the chimney stack, but Rex and I had not seen any blue spots in the area at the time. It was also not the same shade of blue as the sky. Could there be some technical reason for this? I have no idea where that blue dot came from. Neither does Rex. If it was a reflection or refraction, the sun was at the wrong angle for it. There was nothing around to explain that distinctive shade of electric blue, like a single bolt of lightning energy. I did some reading and came across some articles that said that blue orbs could be signs of spiritual guardians. Could it be my spirit guardian letting me see that she was around? The village of Zelenoy is just another one of the thousands of nondescript, tiny villages that can be found hidden away here or there in the dense evergreen forests of Siberia. Indeed, from the main road, you wouldn't even know a town existed if not for the tiny, poorly maintained dirt road and handmade sign. Not much of an indication that at least a dozen or so people lived in the dense wood, but at least enough for a postal worker to know about. The town itself is not the topic of this story. 
though I could probably spend at least a week recounting the various local legends and superstitions that thrive in that tiny, closed society. It was about the end of January when my girlfriend's brother, Alexei, suggested that I might enjoy a visit to an abandoned train station. He knew I had a particular interest in urban exploration, left over from my days in California. After one of Babushka's various story nights where she would recount the local folklore, she mentioned members of the family who had worked for the local police and who had reported ghostly figures and sounds from inside closed-down depots. For decades, it was common for the imperial family to send undesirables by train, coach, or foot into exile deep into Siberia. Many of those locations still exist, and one of them is a short way from a tiny village called Zelenoy. We were advised to pack light, though by now I was well aware of the tone of sarcasm in Russia. I expected light to mean to come prepared for a sled dog race. Though when I showed up at Alexei's home, I found most of the group in jeans and hoodies. It was no warmer than one degree Celsius. I pictured a quaint little town locked among the pines, snow hanging heavy on the branches, and children and villagers milling about preparing their wares for a farmer's market. Nope, totally wrong. The turnoff for the village is quite literally a notch in the tree line, with a dirty road meandering through. The snow was more like a dense freezing slush due to a warm rainstorm that had hit the area a couple days before, leaving massive puddles the size of our tiny Isuzu dotting our path. Alexei was quite accustomed to the conditions, though, navigating those pitfalls like a New York taxi driver escaping rush hour traffic. The road was long and winding, and the insulation from the dense forest kept every sound hidden until we were practically in the middle of town. We parked next to an abandoned Soviet-era Militsiya checkpoint shack, sort of an unofficial marker to designate the boundary of the village. The trip from the main paved road to this location took almost an hour to traverse, though it was only about two kilometers in distance. Strapping on our backpacks, we made out in a seemingly random direction. There were no markers or trails to guide us, only the experience of Alexei, our guide, who had been to this spot before. The frozen soil was slippery and tended to collapse under our weight as we sloshed our way deeper into the darkness of the overgrowth. Eventually, we came to a clearing, the one that was obviously man-made. A narrow trough, about 20 feet wide, runs in a mostly straight line. Kicking at the frozen muck on the clearing floor, Alexei managed to clear a small section of railroad track. The steel was in an advanced state of decomposition as, according to Alexei, the track had not been used in 75 years, actually closer to 90. Years of annual thaw, heavy storms, and complete abandonment had made this once busy railroad corridor just another part of the forest. Following in the direction of the tracks, and after hiking for what seemed like another eternity, we finally came across the station. It was far more substantial than I had expected. Being from California, I'd seen frontier train depots from this same era in the 1870s, and they were usually thrown together from whatever materials they had available locally. This structure was somewhat large, about the size of a large house, and made from limestone, covered in a shell of what was probably once polished green granite. The front of the station had what was once an extremely ornate facade, covered in granite with a large clock, and what looked like gilded Cyrillic lettering spelling out train terminal. As is typical of abandoned property in that era, almost no effort was made to secure the building against people entering. There were no boards up over the windows, and the heavy wooden doors had been secured with just a single chain and padlock, which had been broken long before our arrival. Officials pretty much closed up shop one day and never returned. Down the middle of the structure was a large hall with vaulted ceilings and what remained of a brass gas chandelier. At some point in the early Soviet era, they had hastily converted this room to electricity, with exposed wires dangling from holes in the plaster and drooping in long, menacing loops toward the floor, cobbled together with a tarnished electric light fixture here or there. 
Along either wall were rows of benches, still showing their antique lacquer and highly decorative iron scroll work feet and armrests. This was obviously the waiting room, with two large platforms on either end. The platforms were at one point classed in, though the heavy, handmade glass panels had apparently rotted from their sashes and collapsed inward years ago. The platforms, through years of exposure to the harsh Russian elements, were sad, sunken pits with rotten planks growing small ferns and mushrooms. We didn't try to make our way out there, as the flooring was dubious to begin with. At the back of the long central waiting area was the ticket booth and a door leading to a set of spiral stairs. Taking the stairs up, we found the old station master's residence, along with storage for the station supplies and large brass kerosene tanks that still had something in them. Also in this room, we found a series of tickets and ticket stubs, the dates on them ranging from 1880 to March of 1929. Of course, I wanted to keep them, but was told by the others in the group that taking things from haunted places was very bad luck. Things will follow you, they said over and over again. I of course was thinking, hum, souvenir. I ended up taking their advice and leaving empty-handed. The upper floors, being a residence, had a lot of personal touches, framed in black and white photos on the walls. Brass candlesticks are still sitting on the mantle of a coal fireplace. In the main room of the station master's apartment, we could hear what sounded like crying. It was rather loud, and something that none of us expected. So loud in fact that we all started searching, expecting to find someone lost and looking for their parents. It didn't dawn on us until after we had completed a search of the entire property that we were quite alone. As we made our way back upstairs to continue our exploration, we heard the crying again. It definitely sounded like a child, and most of us swear they were saying something softly in Russian, though we couldn't make out the actual words. We took several shots with our phone cameras, hoping to capture an orb or a dark spot. Unfortunately, our moving around in these spaces kicked up considerable dust, and every image was hampered by clouds of it. If people are interested, I'll see about posting a couple of the images here. Maybe you'll catch something we didn't. After coming back downstairs, we explored the main hall and waiting area. The sensations in this room were profound. The air felt heavy, like we were actually at the bottom of a swimming pool. The weight of the invisible water pushing down on us from all sides. One of Alexei's friends who had come along on our adventure had to leave the room as he was feeling quite unwell. He stood outside in the sub-zero temperatures for over an hour while we continued to look, unwilling to come back inside. The room had an overpowering smell of wood that had aged for over a century. The same smell you get after opening a long, closed cedar chest or walking into a store in an old west town. It was a powerful odor that we actually didn't get used to over time, and our clothing carried the smell with us after leaving. Near the back, however, just around the gate to the ticket booth, the smell changed. The only way I can describe it is as a dense floral perfume. It was the dead of winter, and although small shrubs and ferns were scattered around the property, inside and out, there were no flowers, we couldn't find any bottles of chemicals or anything else in the area that would account for it. We generally agreed it smelled like a commercial product, something created rather than natural to the area. We even walked around behind the station, to the point outside just opposite the location in the ticketing area, but could smell nothing. On the way back to the car, we took the long way around and passed through the village. It was different, to say the least. If any of you have ever seen the early 90s TV series Twin Peaks, imagine that show, dubbed in Russian. It was filmed in a village of maybe 20 people. Sitting in the car, desperately trying to get feeling back in my legs as we bumped and jostled down the road back to civilization, it really hit me for the first time. Vidbushka had been telling me about all these ghost stories and had warned me many times that ghosts were simply part of everyday life in this part of the world. I finally understood what she meant. Tucked around every corner, past every dark, fog-shrouded tree line, was the location of some tragedy. So many people have died here for so long, had their lives taken from them, 
and been shipped off to this frightening wilderness to fend for themselves among the ghosts. No wonder the country itself is haunted.